very much. So we'll discuss today uh, about crafting a journal article. And I'll uh, look at a few critical aspects because journal article writing is a big task. So the critical aspects that, uh, you know, affects our thinking or that influences our thinking and influences our writing, I'll discuss those uh, critical aspects. Uh, as uh, Dr. Toimu Sheikh introduced, I'm uh, Niaz Sheikh. I'm from the School of Civil Mining, Environmental and Architectural Engineering from University of Wollongong. So as you know, Australia, uh, uh, was an Aboriginal land and it was colonized by British. Um, and we start our every every meeting, every presentation starts with acknowledgement of the country. So I acknowledge and we acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which the University of Wollongong is situated. We say it Darawa land. Uh, that's where the Wollongong University is situated. And we pay our respects to Aboriginal elders, past and present, who are the knowledge holders and teachers. We acknowledge their continued spiritual and cultural connection to country as we share knowledge, teaching, learning and research within the university. We also pay respect to the knowledge embedded forever within the Aboriginal custodianship of the country. Uh, now, uh, let's look at why it is Wollongong, you know. The name Wollongong is an Aboriginal name. Uh, the, the meaning of Wollongong, there are quite a few meanings. One of the meanings of Wollongong is the sound of the sea. And as you can understand, it is beside the sea. And and it's a vast, uh, you know, that's, that's what Wollongong, uh, you know, CBD is. So it is beside the sea, the miles and miles and after miles are beaches. And the beaches are beautiful, more beautiful and more beautiful. And uh, it is close to Sydney. It's about one hour journey from Sydney. It's about 80 kilometer from Sydney airport. So, the, and and you can go to Sydney within, um, you know, one hour. And University of Wollongong, uh, I, I joined here in 2007. And it, it, it is a very green university. Everywhere you will see three greens and you will see students uh, beside the tree. They are studying, drinking coffee and and gossiping and, and studying also. So it's a very green university. That's a glimpse of our buildings. At the main campus, we have quite a few campuses. Uh, uh, one of our uh, uh, large campuses is in Dubai. So UW Dubai. Uh, we have around 35,000 students. So that's the size of the university that uh, you can uh, think about. So it's a vibrant university. Uh, ranking wise in uh, 2023 QS ranking, UOW ranked uh, uh, 162, uh, 162 at university in the QS ranking in the world. Civil engineering has all, always been within 50 to 100 uh, in all the rankings at UOW, our civil engineering, as I say, within 50 to 100, that's our ranking uh, in, I think, in last 10 years. So it's, it's a vibrant university. I think the ranking doesn't uh, tell all the stories, but it's, it's a young university. It's less than 50 years old. It's a vibrant university. It's a research intensive university. And, uh, you know, one of the good aspects of University of Wollongong is it is beside the sea. So the temperature wise, it's the best in Australia, I should say. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the environment here is outstanding, I should say, especially uh, I joined, as I say, I joined in 2007, I was in Canada and then I joined here. And since then I'm at UOW, didn't really move. So you can understand it's a good place to live and a good place to study. Now let's come back to the main topic, uh, you know, crafting a journal article. And the discussion that I'll, uh, you know, make today is from the perspective authors. It would be different if you are a reviewer. So perspective would be different as a reviewer, we write articles in a way, or as an author, we write in it, we think a different way. Uh, but you know, I would suggest uh, you all who are especially new writer or even experienced writer like uh, us, uh, we need to keep our knowledge updated. We need to read, uh, you know, books to understand uh, the changes in the writing styles. Right. So there are quite a few books I've just taken randomly. One of the books that attracted my attention is a PhD is not really enough. So a PhD doesn't mean that you are a good writer. PhD doesn't mean that you have the ability to write top tier journal articles. Actually, it's the starting point. And we learn over time, you know, and, and learning doesn't really 
end. Uh, I have taken uh, my slides from quite a few of these books, as you will understand, uh, there are proper references uh, under every slide that I'll present. So my presentation will be uh, uh, more than one hour. I hope you, 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 you can stay one hour with me. Uh, if I go very fast, then please let me know. Uh, if you do not understand me, you can always ask me to slow down. I usually speak fast, so but I can always slow down if you want. Now, uh, it's all about writing. I sometimes hear that, you know, well, I can do good research, you know, but uh, writing is not my strong point. Uh, there's a lot of us also say, where when, if I go to a conference, then I meet students, meet young academics, uh, and then they say that, well, I can do good research, but uh, you know, writing is not my, uh, my strong point. Uh, but this is not correct, because as a researcher, if you are a researcher, then you are a writer. So researcher means writer. We all are writers. So we need to know how to write. We need to know how to present. We need to know how to talk. And we also need to know how to make people understand what we do, right? And one of the ways to let people know what we do is by writing, right? So we all are writers. So there is no way that uh, you can tell me or I can tell you that, well, my strong point is research, is experiment or is analysis, not writing. No, all of our strong points should be writing and we all are writers. Now, big question. Write or not to write? Should I write or shouldn't I write? Now, how can I answer this question? So let's answer this question by saying that, do you have a story to tell? If you have a story to tell, then yes, you can write. Now, when I was a student, I completed my PhD from University of Hong Kong. It was that time top 20 universities in the world. Uh, and there's lots of schools, lots of departments. So we used to have coffee together in podium. Uh, and then uh, there were science PhDs, there were engineering PhDs, literature PhD. We used to have coffee together and then discuss. The people, uh, you know, my friends who studied uh, science, they used to say that basic research is better than applied research, you know, because they do basic research, basic scientific research. Uh, and there are debates among us, which, which is good, basic or applied research. But to me, there are only two types of research, really. One is rich research, the other one is poor research. There is only two types of research, you know. It doesn't matter whether you are sci doing scientific research or engineering research or research uh, on, on literature or English literature or Urdu literature, it doesn't matter. How do you really conduct the researches? Rich research or poor research? Now, one important thing is that, uh, to remember is that no effort can improve the research of a flawed project. If the project is flawed, Project is not based on good hypothesis. Project doesn't have a good set of objectives. Then, you know, no effort can improve it. So the, the first thing uh, comes with the project. Uh, I may not have time to discuss about project today, but maybe we can discuss some other time. Uh, uh, you know, the project has to be a well-designed project. If you want to get good outcome, then you have to have good project good project, uh, thoughtful project, right? With the, with the clear object, clear cut objectives, clear cut experimental program, clear cut discussions about the experimental program. That's how we develop the project, right? At Ulongong University, when uh, a student, I think I supervised about 10 uh, Pakistani PhD students already. So when we get a new student, we allow time, especially two to three months time to really uh, design a project. If on, it is a PhD project, a short project, as you can understand, but even then it takes three months to six months time to find out the objective, to clearly write the objectives, to have experimental program well written, and then we start the project, right? So the project has to be uh, well-crafted, well-designed, and well-thought-of project, right? Now, before writing a manuscript, you know, we need to have original contribution. Uh, any kind of manuscript, obviously top tier journal articles, you have to, we have to have original contribution. One of my mentors, when I was a PhD student, one of my mentors was Professor Nelson Lamb. He's a professor in Melbourne University. So I was, a, I was an AMPHIL student that time, not a PhD student, AMPHIL student. I did my research, I was writing an article. So I told uh, Professor Nelson Lamb, 
that, you know, Professor, I wrote this article, do you think it would be published? And uh, he replied to me an important uh, he, an important, he gave me an important information. I still tell my students uh, uh, the same thing. He told me that, is there any contribution? Yes, even very little contribution. Do we have very little contribution? You don't need big contribution, but you have to have some contribution. A little is enough, right? And then if you have contribution, you, you package it. You package it in a way that is an article. But if you do not have contribution, no matter how good you package it, it won't be published, but have to have original contribution. So every article have to have even a shred of contribution has to have original contribution. Now, if you have clearly defined uh, original contribution, then yes, you can write. Before writing a manuscript, we need to have original contribution. And then, you know, if it is a PhD or a project, then we might write more than one journal article, right? Uh, so if it is more than one journal articles, then we need to see which experimental program will put in this article uh, or analytical uh, you know, investigation, put this article or that article, right? But every article it should have original contribution and without original contribution, it, it won't be uh, published. Now, two most important things, this is, a, this is kind of advice, I should say, uh, well-crafted manuscript have two most important aspects. One is clarity, right? It has to be clear if information, right? Uh, I can give you an example. So my name is Niaz Sheikh, right? Sometime you can say Niaz, and sometime you can say Sheikh, sometime you can say Niaz Sheikh, right? So that's three. Now, if you don't know me, then it might appear three different people. So in an article, noun cannot be different. If you say, if you ask me Professor Nias, then it has to be Professor Nias. If it is written as Professor Sheikh, then it has to be Professor Sheikh all through, right? So noun cannot be different. Even verbs, okay, might be all right. You can say experiment conducted, experiment carried out, experiment performed, but still, if you use same term, it's better. But verb doesn't really confuse us that much, we understand, but noun does confuse us. Any name uh, uh, can confuse us, right? So has to be clear so that readers are not confused. Now, brevity, brief. Uh, as I said, it's always possible. Whatever you have written, you can cut down 10 to 20%. It's not a big issue. You can always cut down 10 to 20% without uh, really, you know, uh, affecting uh, the quality of the manuscript. So the manuscript has to be brief. Uh, you know, articles are important. Pages are uh, expensive and it increases reading time. If you can be brief, it's always better. So the two most important things that we need to keep in mind is clarity and brevity. It has to be clear, has to be concise, right? Now let's come back to, uh, come to uh, the journal article, right? Now we'll start a journal article. Up to now, I've just given you a brief description of overall uh, articles, overall writing. Now, journal article, now structure of a journal article. I I'm a civil engineer, I'm a structural engineer, right? And and, and there are quite a lot of civil engineering students are here. Uh, I, I know you cannot answer me. If I ask you, what is a structure, right? Have you thought about, we say we, we, we are structurally, you know, what is a structure really? Right? I, I know that, you know, a lot of us will struggle to really answer what is a structure. I can, I, I'll tell you what is a structure. A structure is an organized system, right? It's an organized system. It's always the case. It doesn't need to be civil engineering, any structure, right? If I ask you, what is the structure or organization structure of your university, right? It is also a structure. So essentially means it's an organized system. For civil engineering structure, it's an organized system to carry the load from one place to another place, right? So that's how it is structured. Now we'll look at the structure of a journal article. As I say, structure is an organized system. So now, each stage of the construction, so it's, it's, it's a building, right? Each stage of construction contributes to the overall quality, right? Every stage will contribute to the quality, right? Similarly, each part of the article will contribute to the overall quality of the article. Now, if you hastily assemble articles from here, there, and if you hastily assemble articles, then um, it, it will reveal major cracks. So it's not a good article. And uh, people will understand that it is not a good article, right? 
So there is no shortcut, it has to be well thought of, has to be well structured. You, you cannot just write uh, something and then that can be published as a journal article. No, it will not be. Uh, so there is no shortcut. Now, remember that, you know, I'm uh, I'm an associate editor of Australian Journal of Structural Engineering, right? Uh, and uh, I need to uh, look at many articles and decide right away whether it will go through review or not review. Remember that 70% uh, of the article doesn't go to the reviewer, right? 70% articles do not go to the reviewer. Associate editors and editors just, uh, you know, cut from that point, uh, reject, uh, we say this rejection. It's about 70, 80% article get uh, disc rejected. Now, you know why? Because first impression, when we read an article, we just started reading and within 20 minutes, we understand, well, it's not good for my journal, right? It gives us the impression because the structure is not good enough. Things doesn't look good. And we understand it within 20 minutes. I think 20 minutes is quite generous. Is within 15 minutes, we understand that this article will not really go to the review process. So that's that's how uh, we need to impress the associate editor and the editor, right? Now, if you look at a typical structure of an engineering article, like we have title, we have list of authors and affiliations, we have abstract, keywords, introduction, materials and methods, experimental program, uh, if it is an experimental one or modeling technique, if it's an analytical or numerical article, and then we go result and discussions, conclusions, acknowledgements, references, uh, legends for tables and figures, tables and, and then figures, right? So that's typically uh, the structure, usually structure of an engineering article. Now, uh, this this list or these uh, sections, uh, it, it is guided by the contribution, right? And title words are repeated in the heading and subheading, right? Sometimes I can see that heading and subheading, right? it's just like the experimental program. So heading and subheading should be meaningful, as meaningful as possible. As I said, it will be the contribution and title words uh, would be repeated in heading and subheadings. Now, uh, this structure, should tell us a clear and complete story. When I say clear and complete story, it's a movie. It's not a drama serial that every serial would sell you a little story, but there is no connection. No, it's a complete story. It's a movie. It tells us a story and finishes the story, tell us the contribution. It's like a movie, full movie. As I said, it's not a drama serial or a part of one movie, right? No, it is a complete movie. Now, uh, if you if you look at, uh, you know, okay, let's look at the next slide. So if you look at this order, the manuscripts are not developed in this order. Really, when you write manuscript, uh, people do not write title, then list of author, then abstract, right? No, it's not the case. Sometimes, you know, we started with the experimental program. Most of our students at UOW, under uh, my supervision or our supervision, they started with writing experimental program, then result and discussion, and then goes upward and then introduction. And then abstract is the one that we write at the end. As I said, finished product may give an impression that all went well, it's not really uh, that you, you kept writing from title to to the uh, conclusions, and um, uh, well, I read my students' article uh, sometimes maybe more than twenty times because I just keep improving and improving and improving. So that's how uh, we we write article. Now, if you look at uh, the part of this article, not every part confuses us. You know, you are not in front of me. If you are in front of me, I would have asked you which part is the most difficult to write. Right? Um, I think, you know, people to people will vary, but I understand that the difficult parts are, first title is also difficult to write. Abstract is one of the most difficult part to write. Obviously introduction is difficult to write and, and conclusions are also difficult to write. So if I pick up title, abstract, introduction and conclusion, these four items, are difficult to write properly and they need lots of thinking. So in my presentation, I'll emphasize on these four parts only because results and discussion doesn't really confuse, results and discussions do not really confuse us that much. Right, now, purpose of a good structure of an article, what is the purpose of the structure? Uh, it, it reinforces the contribution, right? You need to structure it good, why? To reinforce the contribution, the contribution of this article. How do we reinforce the contribution? 
by repeating the keywords. The keywords, why should I get keywords? Keywords, you should get it from the title. So the title is important and we get the keywords from the title and we reinforce the contribution by organizing it by the structure of the journal article, well-organized article, right? And we divide the article into informative sections, few informative sections, right? Introduction, then, uh, you know, as I said, the structure, if you look at the structure, there are sections. We divide it into informative sections. So it's the focus of the article, flow of the story. So the structure should be in a way that it flows. It tells us the story in an interesting way. Now, quality. How should we know the quality of a good uh, structure or the of a journal article? Now, the structure should be in a way that it has to be informative. Essentially means that contributions are clearly identified. Nothing is unexpected. When you read it, when you look at the structure, it shouldn't become, you shouldn't be unexpected, right? Surprise, oh, I didn't think that it would be here. No, it shouldn't be the case. It's linked to the title and abstract. The structure is linked to the title. If we look at the headings and subheading, we should be able to get keywords there. Logical progression, right? One after another should guide us in a way that it's logical, it's logical progression and brief and concise. As I say, brevity, uh, is important, conciseness is important. It shouldn't be overly detailed. The, 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 the title or section heading shouldn't be too long and it shouldn't be too short also, right? So it has to be informative, it has to be brief and concise. It doesn't need to be too detailed. Essentially, it doesn't mean to be a title cannot be two or three lines long, not really. Uh, but it's like, then it shouldn't be like two word experimental program. It doesn't really look good to me, right? So as I said, not overly detailed, not to concise, right? Now that's the title, right? And well, why did I take this picture? This is my picture quite a few years ago. My, my daughter uh, drew this picture for me, right? And uh, why did I show this to you? <clears throat> because, uh, you know, title uh, is, is, is the face of the article. Now we'll discuss about title now. Right. Title is, is the face of the article. Now, um, and, and by looking at the title, when you meet someone at, at first, you, what, what, what is in front of you is a, is a face, right? And, and we get an impression about that person without knowing the background, without knowing anything by looking at the face. We have some assessment of a person whenever we meet someone, right? And it takes only uh, less than a minute to get that impression. Similarly, if you think about the title of an article, by reading the title, how long it takes, 20, 30 seconds, right? And we get the impression about the article. So title, as you can understand, is quite important. So title is the face of the article. It's the first impression, right? And reveals the kind of the article as we look at a person's face and understand whether it's grumpy or is it kind or friendly, right? We, we assess it. Similarly, the title also, we do not know the article, but title really reveals us the kind of article it is. So what makes the title unique is the way that words are assembled to differentiate the word from others words. So if you have a catchy title, we say catchy title, it's different from others. Right, it tells the story, and it is it is telling us what about the uh, article is. So the title is quite important, right? Now, look at you know few titles, then we'll understand what we mean by the title. Now, if you look at gas assisted, well, it's not civil engineering, so I understand that you may not know the meaning of quite a few words. I do not know either. So, but looking at the title, I think, you know, uh, if we do not know the words, it will help us to understand better. So it says gas assisted powder injected molding. I'll give you a few seconds to read this title and to get an idea whether is, this title is good or not in your view. It says gas assisted powder injecting molding, right? So in my assessment, so it's not in a specific title, halfway uh, being specific and halfway being general. It just talked about power injected molding. I really don't know, you know, much about it. 
is it talking about any specific application of powder injected molding? Maybe not. And then if you look at GAPIN, I understand is it gas assistant powder injected molding, but is it necessary? This part, I don't think so, because you don't really need an abbreviation uh, uh, in the in the title, right? So it is really not a good title because we don't get really much out of it. Uh, do not give us a good impression because it's not, uh, it's halfway specific, halfway uh, general, right? Now let's look at the second one. Highly efficient waveguide grating couplers using silicon on insulator. And then B is silicon on insulator for high output waveguide grafting couples. Right, they are the same thing. Same article, but uh, is two different titles, right? Is there any difference between these titles or do they tell us the same information or different information? They're giving you a few seconds to read. Okay, so let's look at my assessment, my analysis. The first title, you see, it talks about waveguide. So when we read it, highly efficient waveguide, right? So it is about waveguide, that's what I understand. Grafting couplers using silicon on insulator, right? Now, the second one is basically talking about the focus should be silicon on insulator, right? The first one, if the first title is true, then the article should be based on waveguide. If the second article, second title is true, then it should be based on silicon on insulator. So if it is other way, then that's not a good title, right? So when you say highly efficient waveguide, so the first thing comes first, that should be the focus of the article. Not for this one, silicon on insulator should not be the focus of the article. The article should be focused on waveguide because it came first. It gives us an impression, impression that the article is about waveguide. The second one, Second title, when you look at it, it's not really a waveguide. It's talking about silicon on insulator because it came first. So we understand it should be the main focus of the title. Quite a few titles so that you understand how important it is. Now, there's the two titles, Web Services and Enabling Technology for Trading Partners Mutiny Virtual Integration. And then second one is Web Services, Integrating Virtual Communities of Trading Partners. Now, between these two titles, which one is better? You don't need to answer. I'll, I'll give you the answer. But if it is from face to face, then I would have expected answer from the audience. Looking at these two titles, right? Which one is better? So let's look at the first one. An enabling technology for trading partners, mutiny, virtual integration. So that's, that's five, uh, you know, words modified. One, two, three, four, five. So there's a five modifier. That means this is the integration, that one is adjectives, and then other three are adverbs, right? So it's very difficult to read, really. Very difficult to understand the meaning of it. Now, web services, the second one is short. Integrating is a verb. Integrating virtual communities of trading partners. So the verbs make the things easier to understand. It's an action verb, right? Verbs means action. So action makes the things easier to understand, right? Now. One thing that you might think that is this colon necessary? Can we write web services through integrating virtual communities of trading partners? Will that be better? I think so, because we sometimes use colon or semicolon. Or colon. Uh, I, I'm, I do not oppose to it. I do not oppose it. But you know, making it more meaningful is important. If you say web services through integrating virtual communities of trading partners that will make the things much easier to understand, right? Now, if you look at this one, vapor pressure assisted void growth and cracking of polymerics and interfaces, right? Is it a good title or not? So what does, what does it say us? First of all, you know, the vapor pressure assistant, if you look at the vapor VAPOR, right, not U. So essentially means that it's an American, uh, it is American English, so it's for an American journal, right? Could be ACI journal, could be ASCE journal of structural engineering or, or as such, right? American journal. Now, the problem here is these two N. Sometimes 
when we write title, we understand it because we know what we mean, but the reader may not understand the way that we write, right? What makes the thing difficult? So if I read it once again with you, then you'll understand vapor pressure assisted void growth and cracking of polymeric films and interfaces. Does it mean cracking of polymeric films and cracking of interfaces? Or it means cracking of polymeric films and the interface is other words. So I don't really understand because I'm not in that field. Uh, and then, but as a, as a reader, I should understand the meaning, right? Because it confuses me because this two end really complicates the meaning. Uh, and you, you really don't get, it is easy for us because, you know, we don't know the meaning of these words, but we cannot make connections properly because this two end, which one is what, we really do not know. I think that's the last one. A new approach to blind multi-user detection based on inter-story symbol correlations. Obviously, foreign words, we don't know the meaning. But what we get out of this title then? First of all, it's a approach. Is it a method, a system, or a technique? What is approach? Approach is, is, is a vague word. It can mean many things. So I don't like approach, you know? Essentially means that it doesn't mean much. It doesn't mean, doesn't tell you whether it's a method, whether it's a technique, whether it's a system, or, or what, right? And then new. New is a big problem. Sometimes you see the title novel, a new technique, new approach. Now, remember that this is new for the time being now, but about 10 years down the track, there will be many methods. So it may not remain new anymore. So you mean your article is valid only at the point of publication. It will not survive the test of time, right? After 10 years, it's not new anymore. So your article doesn't mean new thing, but people may read your article after 10 years. So this new novel, it, is, it should be avoided. We cannot write this. What is new here, again, is an inter-symbol correlation or, 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 or you modified it? If it is modified, then we should write a modification of inter-symbol correlation to blind multi-user detection. So th this title are not good enough, right? Not good enough. So title, as I say, as I'm saying, by going through with few titles, you understand the title uh, is, is an obstacle to write. Now, the purpose of the title, so we can write, if we know the purpose, and if we know the quality of a good title, then we should be able to write. Now, what title does? It allows to place enough keywords, right, for the search engine to find your article. So title should have enough keywords. It catches attention of the reader, it states the contribution of the article concisely, very concisely, in, in one line or in one and a half line, right? It differentiates from other titles. If one article is published, you cannot write the same title for your article because then if I say Google or or, or any other search engine, uh, right, Web of Science or Scopus, then that article will come first because you that article published before your article. So you just don't want it. You want your article to be cited to be known by the people, to be read by the people, right? So it has to come first. So by searching title word, your article should come first. So it should differentiate from other titles. If similar title published, so you shouldn't be using the same title. Now the qualities of good titles, it should be unique. It should be differentiated from other articles. It should be lasting. It should uh, you know, last the test of time. There should be no new novel. You, know, you shouldn't have used this one has to be concise. So the title cannot be two or two and a half lines long. One line, maybe one and a half line, not, not more than that. So, and it has to be clear. Avoid using long modifier, as I said, five uh, word modifiers shouldn't be the case. And it has to be easy to find. Words are carefully chosen. It should be representative. So title should represent the article and has to be catchy, right? If you want to attract the attention of the editor or associate editor, Whoever reads the first has to, uh, you know, create an interest to go through the article, to read the article, right? Now, I give you an example of one of our articles. Uh, is written by uh, a PhD student, uh, uh, Nabil Farhan. So this article, you know, uh, I'm not showing that this is a good article, but I'm giving you an example uh, so that you understand it. Uh, design of geopolymer. This article got more over 300 citations. 
uh, so it's, it's a well-read article. Now, design of geopolymer concrete with GGPFS at MB and curing condition using Taguchi method. Now, if you read this our title, to me, it's a good title. You know why? Because it has a verbal form. What did we do? We design it. All right. And adjectives and number have described strong point of contribution. What is the contribution here? Because we said it's ambient curing condition. Up to that point, it used to be heat curing. So we said, no, we have developed geopolymer concrete, which is general term, general field. It's a geopolymer concrete, but our contribution is that we design it at ambient curing condition. It's meaningful, right? You understand that we have actually designed geopolymer concrete with with this ggpfs right ground generated blast furnace like so that's the country and and we chose it in 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 few keywords so geopolymer concrete and being curing condition taguchi method right and as to sometime you can use acronyms if they are they are well known or if it is your first contribution if you're the first one to do it then obviously we can write acronyms there so uh, in a nutshell if I finish it, then I should say that has to be in a verbal form, has to be precise, has to be meaningful, has to be catchy, and it needs mastery to write the title. Now, we'll discuss the second part. We'll discuss the abstract. Now, this is the heart, right? Heart of a human being. And if you look at the heart, I'm, I'm not a biologist, but I did study biology in my HSC only. So if you look at the heart, it has four parts, right? Left atrium, right atrium, left ventricle, right ventricle, right? So that's the heart. Now, abstract is, is the heart of the article. Quite important, quite difficult to write, right? So abstract is the heart of an, of an article. As the heart has four parts, as you can see, that it has four different parts. So, abstract also has four parts, just four parts. Part one, why did you study? Second, how did you solve the problem? Third, what did you find? And fourth is, so what? What does it mean? So, these are the four parts of an abstract. So, first, why did you study it? What was the really problem? That means topic of the article. How did you solve the problem, the methodology? What did you find is the result? And so what? What is the significance of this study? So if you can write these four parts properly, then it's a good abstract, right? Now look at here. So this is same article, then this is what we have written. I'll give you a minute to read this one and I'll ask you a few questions. Uh, obviously, you cannot answer, but uh, you know I'll give you the answer. So this is the article that, that's the article. That's what we have written. It's, it's our article, but I, I'll also criticize this article. So this is the abstract. It's a short abstract. It tells us first part, right? What did you, you know, why did you study? What was the problem? So we say that we use Taguchi method and we used ambient curing condition. And what did we do? We looked at influence of different components. And how did we get? We wrote the results, right? But we didn't write the significance. We didn't write that this, this will create, you know, construction with geopolymer concrete much easier in in situ condition. That's what we didn't write. So because that was the part which we wrote significance there. That's why we didn't write it. But missing part is the significance. What could have been added? The significance. Now, if you look at the coherence between abstract and the title, look at the title, look at the first line of the abstract. Do you get the keywords? Look at the first uh, title of the abstract and look at the first line of, the, of, of this abstract. Do you get the keyword? You can write the first line in a better way. Look at the first sentence. If there are 0% keyword, obviously you don't need to write it. If there are 20% of the keyword, not enough. So there should be 30 to 80% keywords of the title in the very first sentence. If it is less than 30 to 80%, then that's not a good first line, right? If it is about 
then that essentially means that you have repeated your title. So you, it is not a good one. So I would say that the first sentence that you write should have 30 to 80% of the keywords, the keywords in the title. If it is not the case, sometimes I can see that people write a general description uh, of the field in the first line. Not necessary. Not necessary. You don't need to. That doesn't give us any uh, good impression, right? As I said, it has to have four parts. Four parts, right? And if you remember that you have to have 30 to 80% of the keywords in the very first sentence, then the, the starting is good, right? Now, what is the purpose of the abstract, right? So, as I said, it's all from the perspective of the writers. It's all from the perspectives of the writers. If the contribution is in more precise details. When I read the title, I understand the contribution, but when we read the abstract, the contribution now in more precise details. It's not an indicative summary, right? You don't need a summary. We need to write maximum information with minimum number of words. An article should be found quite easily. Abstract will have few keywords that any search engine can pick up, right? Now, quality of the good abstract, it has to be complete. That essentially means that it has all four parts, it's connected, right? Title words are found, it has to be brief, self-sufficient by reading the abstract, I'll understand the contribution of the article. And obviously it should be reflective to the contribution. What is the contribution of the article? It has to be there in the abstract and it has to be written in a living language that I mean, that creates uh, you know, attraction, that creates uh, you know, uh, in our mind to read further, right? So if you read an abstract and you find oh, not, not good enough, then you won't read it. So the abstract should be written in a living language, in an attractive way, so that it creates attraction in us to read further. Right, now, Remember that not all abstract will have four parts, right? There are a few exceptions, right? When we write review articles, right? Uh, we do not have result really. We have indication of results. So sometimes review articles, the abstract of a review article doesn't have all four parts, short articles, right? We write one or two page articles, short articles, and abstract will be two to three lines. We may not have all four parts. Now extended abstract, sometimes conference articles may have extended abstract. And at that time when you write uh, extend abstract, we, we do not, we haven't completed the experimental program. So we do not know the precise result. So there is no indication of precise result in the extended abstract. So these are <clears throat> few exceptions, okay? So that's all about abstract. Now we'll go a little bit of introduction. That's one of the most difficult uh, sections to write in an article. So now introduction, I say it's, an, it's the hand of the article, right? Introduction is the hand of the article. So what does hand do then? It welcomes us, right? And it guides someone not so familiar. So if I go to a new place, someone takes me from the airport, someone shows me the hotel, right? It's a guide, right? It, it guides, great and introduce a new topic and invite to the fall, right? So as you can see, when we read an introduction, the readers may not know the subject or, or the topic. So the introduction is a place where you, we need to welcome the readers. We need to guide the readers. We need to invite the reader to follow the article, to read the whole article. But it is an evil. It's difficult to write. Then it's more difficult to write than methodology and result. So introduction, I find it, especially among our students, is the most difficult one to write. But having said that, if you know the meaning of the introduction, the quality of a good introduction, then it won't be that difficult to write. Now, remember that readers just read the title and the abstract, right? Already read the title. So you might think that the readers should have a clear picture of the contribution of the article, but it's not really the case. So what is missing in the abstract then? It's the context. Why did we do it? Is it, you know, the context is missing, right? We don't know what has been done before this article, right? The context is missing there. Now, it also evokes the interest of the reader. So essentially means that when we read uh, interaction, it is like a story. You, you feel interested in reading and reading and reading. So it has to be written clear and concise way. Uh, do not need to be <coughs> too long. Sometimes 
I can see that introduction is written too long and it's sometimes boring to read it, right? That doesn't need to be too long, really. Now, introduction is read before the rest of the articles, right? You know, usually people read it before the rest of the article. So it should contain materials that should be read before the rest of the article. So if you have some material that is essential to understand the article, that has to be introduction. It provides a, a, a provides background information, right? To facilitate the understanding of the project, right? And, and it excludes preliminary fact. So <clears throat> when someone reading a journal article, that person might have some expertise on that uh, area, right? So it doesn't need to provide many preliminary facts, doesn't? So if it is a reinforced concrete structure, so you don't need to say that concrete is, uh, you know, uh, is, is a coarse aggregate, fine aggregate with cement or binder. So this kind of general information is not needed, uh, right? Um, so exclude preliminary fact doesn't necessarily need to make it too big, right? No need to provide excessive preliminary fact in the introduction. Provide the fact that is important to understand the main findings presented in the article, right? Now, what does it include? It includes typically the reasons for undertaking the project. That means nature and scope of the project, problem or question answers, and it discusses about relevant finding that essentially means that brief summary of the things that has been done before, not an extended summary, uh, uh, not needed, uh, you know, to write many things about previous, uh, you know, work, but the one that's important to really uh, present the context of the article. As you, you don't really need to write too much because a lot of review articles are available, right? So you don't need to review in details everything, no, not really. It provides special background information. Uh, summarize you, your own work. You can summarize your own work, the work that is done before, but doesn't need to be too extensive. Doesn't need to you know, present yourself too much. It's not a social media outlet. It's not Facebook, it's not Twitter. You don't really need to publish, publicize yourself. People know you. If you have been publishing, people know your article, people know you, right? Uh, as I say, it is not a place to show your talents, but provide some information about the work that you have done. So essentially means that you are an expert in that field that has to be uh, established in a very uh, short, in a few short sentences, right? The work that you have done before this article, that can be a special background information. Now, what does it typically cover? As I said, general background, previous findings by other, right? Sets the foundation, problem being investigated, state the question, answered findings of other, uh, uh, you know, other challenged or extended indication of the outcome. It's an indication of the outcome, not precise numerical result. We have provided <coughs> numerical result in the in the abstract, but not in the introduction. We just do not provide numerical result in the introduction. Now let's look at the same article. You read the abstract, right? And we have given the really the results. We get a uh, 60.4 megapascal at seven days, right? At some ambient curing condition. But if you look at the last paragraph of the introduction, what did I say? We said the aim of this study was to propose an optimum mix proportion for geopolymer concrete by considering most influential parameters, resulting in high compressive strength and desirable workability at ambient curing condition using Taguchi method. So we, we didn't really row that it was 60 megapascal, right? We just gave an idea, all right? Or, or not numerical result, but say that high compressive strength and obviously desirable workability that we have achieved through this exercise, right? So that's uh, the introduction. Now, introduction is a place to write about the findings and reasoning in a story format. It has to be lively, has to be engaging. It's like a story. As I said, my mentor, Professor Nelson Lamb, uh, as I said, when I was a uh, master's student. So if I read his article, the introduction, uh, even that time, I find it, is he's telling a story, right? So introduction is kind of a story. And the, the, the and you will write it by writing and writing will write better. So it has to be lively and engaging. And readers should be fired up by reading. Oh, okay, that's good. That's where I have to know more, right? The fired up. And a reader, by reading the introduction, right? If they haven't gone through your experimental program and result, by reading the introduction, they will appreciate you as, a, as an author, 
not as a scientist, right? As an author, that okay, you actually, I know a lot now by reading your introduction. That's what uh, the readers will, will try to appreciate it, right? Because they don't, haven't read your uh, experimental program, don't know you as a scientist, but they will get an idea how good writer you are by reading the introduction. Now, <clears throat> this is Sydney uh, Harbour Bridge, and that's Sydney Opera House, right? That's Sydney Opera House. And this is the photo, uh, as, as you know, we have um, the two fireworks, usually in a year. One is New Year's Day, the other one is Australian Day. Now, uh, I'm quite sure you might have watched fireworks, uh, you know, fireworks started slowly, but the, it ends, the firework ends in a bang, right? The last one is dum, 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 you know, you know, it's bang. So the fireworks finishes with some bangs. Similarly, introduction should end with a bang, with, with, with something that reader would be interested to know the rest of the article. Quite often the not, I find introduction, the end of the introduction is like a table of contents. Section one tells this, section two tells this, section three tells this, section four tells this. That's what the introduction ends up and it's boring. It's unnecessary. There is no place for table of content at the end of, of the introduction. At the end of the introduction should finish with something that tells you that, okay, it tells the reader that, okay, I'll just go and read the rest of the article. So do not write table of contents at the end of the introduction. That's not a good piece of writing. Now, a few good advice. So do not copy and paste sentences from various parts of the article in the introduction. So introduction is not a place so that you can copy from different places and put it into the introduction. No, that's not the case, right? So the quality of good introduction has to be mindful. Efforts to assess the bridge, the knowledge gap. It has to be in a story format, right? It answers the question of all why questions. Authoritative, you need to show that you are an authority. Uh, you are, you know, uh, you, are, you, you have the master in that field, adequate and accurate references. It has to be complete. The key references are included, right? And has to be concise, not too long. Right? It has to be concise. That's what the quality of a good introduction. Now, there are a few problems of an introduction you will see. Uh, a story plot, right? Discrete story versus connected story. So, because, you know, we are tempted to get few things from this article, few things from that article, and then put the things together so that it's, it looks like a good introduction. And because you are reading it a few times, you find that no flaw, but it's not the case, right? Shouldn't be the case. It has to be in a story format. So it has to be connected. And, and flowing. Plagiarism. So you cannot copy full or part of a sentence from another article, even if it is your article. You cannot copy that. Because when we submit an article, we give copyright to the publisher. So that's not any more of our, our writing. Yes, our writing, but it's, we, do not, we do not have full authority of it. So if you copy your own, then you also need to refer. Imprecision. Sometime, uh, I'll show you imprecision uh, after this slide. Sometimes, uh, you know, uh, you know, authors are tempted to cite articles that they haven't read it. Right? They haven't read it. So that's, we say, imprecision, judgmental. Sometimes we discuss about other articles. We say that's good result, good, not good result, uh, reliable, not reliable result. So if you use any kind of adjectives, this kind of adjectives, adjectives represent claim. So when you claim something, then you have to substantiate the claim. You need to say, why do you think it is not reliable? Right? If it is limited, then why do you think limited? If you say this is a good result, then you need to, about other words, if you say that's, that represents good work, why do you think it's good work? So when you use adjectives, be mindful, be careful. You need to justify it. It's, it represents claim. We are claiming that it is not good or it is good. So we need to justify it, right? Now, when I say imprecision, there's, there's many, in many, uh, you know, this imprecision, I see it in many articles. When I review article, when as, as an editor, when uh, as a reviewer, when I look at article as an associate editor, then I find this is one of the common problems. So this is the one that I've taken, uh, you know, from our article, that article that we have shown you. So it says geopolymer concrete doesn't contain any ordinary Portland cement, and hence it is considered as green concrete. Geopolymer concrete is proven to have good mechanical properties with reduced greenhouse gas emission. So we said this is fine. 
data, right? So because we have get the idea from Article Five. Now look at this one. More recently, so this is from another article, not from our article. So more recently, several studies were focused on these FRP composite for the construction of new concrete structure, such as concrete field FRP tubes and FRP bars, reinforced bar reinforced concrete members, right? Four to twenty-three. So how many references are? Twenty references for one line. You know, the author must be kidding. That for one line he read twenty articles. I can guarantee you that he might not have, or she, or they might not have read, uh, you know, even three or four articles. So this is called imprecision. Hasn't read the article, or they haven't read the articles, but they still uh, reference the article to increase the reference list. Right? Is it, isn't it ridiculous that you know, say one line if from twenty articles? Does it make sense? Right? Doesn't doesn't really make sense at all, right? So this is, we say, imprecision, right? And anyone can understand that these authors did not read all these articles, right? If they read it, then they wouldn't need to cite 20 articles for one sentence, right? Good. Now, talking about visuals, I will not go in details about visuals. Visuals means tables and, and, and figures, right? So that's what we mean by visuals, right? Now, and visuals, that's what we say, is, 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 is announcement, right? So when we, we, we announce something, when we read some announcement, so we really do not need to see the person. We just need to understand, right? Right? So it is not necessary to the person to hear his or her voice, right? We don't need to see the person to hear. Similarly, visuals are like that. If I look at any tables, and any figures that should be self-contained. I should understand everything from that figures and tables. I do not need to read the whole articles to understand tables or figures. So tables and figures should be by their own. It's an announcement, right? I do not need to uh, see who is announcing the announcement, right? So tables and figures should be like that way. So why do we use visuals? Because it attracts attention, right? It explores the, and, and figures are very easy to navigate. You can go one figure to another figure. It's non-linear, as I said, one figure to another figure. It has gaps and redundancies. Like you see text one after another, you know, keeping our attention to the text is boring, it's difficult, but attention to the figures are important because you just don't need to read one after another. You can really leap through it. You can put your eye here and there, right? And easy to, to uh, you know, uh, go, from place to place. Now, a few rules for visuals, for tables and figures. It doesn't need to ask more questions than it answers. So sometimes I see that XX is written something doesn't make sense, right? So those, so that essentially means that it really creates more questions than answers. It has to be custom designed, right? Does it, because someone wrote in this way, so I'm writing in this way. No, not because the article and your article uh, uh, might be different. So it has to be custom designed. It has to be complexity in steps, right? Simple to complex, not complex to simple. So complexity should be in steps. What, does, what do I mean? If you look at few rules, the visuals, the tables and figures should be based on contribution. It shouldn't be based because it is easy to draw, right? Then you don't need it. it should be based on contribution. Figures and tables should complement the text. And the purpose of the figures and tables should be immediately apparent. When I read the text, I understand that I need a table now, right? So it has to be, a, and it has to be concise, but clear. It doesn't need to be too compact figure, right? It can be concise, but it has to be clear. And as I said, to understand a figure, I do not need any support. I do not need to read figures. I'll read the tables, I'll read the figures, but by its own and I'll understand it. Sometimes as a reviewer, but this uh, discussion is based on the perspective of authors. But if it were based on perspective of the reviewer, then I would say that, you know, this, I do not need to read the text. I will read the figures only. I'll look at the figures and tables only, right? So we shouldn't need any support to understand the tables and figures. We're coming to the end. Now the conclusion, there's another difficult part to write. Right. I say conclusion is a smiley face. So it 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 
ends the article with some smile, right? So this should be a smiley face, right? Now, if I compare abstract and conclusion, sometimes, you know, uh, people tend to write abstract and conclusion uh, in the same way, okay? So reader often find abstract and conclusion similar or, or same. Sometimes, you know, it's too boring, really. It's too boring. It's too boring. You cannot write abstract and conclusion uh, uh, in the same way. Remember that, um, you know, everything is in the abstract is new to the reader. Reader all don't know anything when they read the abstract. But when it comes to the conclusion, readers have already, readers have already read your full articles. Nothing is new to the reader. So nothing should be new in the conclusion. Nothing should be new in the conclusion. So remember, abstract adopts factual and natural tone. Conclusion leave the reader in a positive mind. You, you leave the reader in a positive mind, the outcome of the article. Now, sometime I can see that in the, in, in, the, in, in the conclusion or at the end of the conclusion, people write that I haven't done this. If I had done this, I would have got this result. So essentially means that, you know, this article is, is not worthy of reading. I just waste my time by reading it. He didn't do it fully. So if you, if you think that, you know, you're, result would be different if you had done it, then why should you write the article now? You do it and then write the article, right? So essentially means that we do not leave the article or finish the article in a smiley face, in a boring face, in a crying face, right, really? So these are not the place, conclusion is not the place to write that if I had done this, I would have got this, or this result uh, is flawed because I have not taken that result properly or that experiment properly. So these are not the, the conclusion is not the place to write um, you know, the limitations, the big limitations in this way, right? So that's not the place for conclusion, right? So the purpose is from the perspective of author, the purpose of the conclusion is one, just one thing, it's a restatement of the contribution. You just restate the contribution. In the title, in the abstract, you, you said about contribution, now you restate the contribution. You either understand the contribution better, Reader read the full article. Now you precisely tell that this is the contribution of the article. It tells us a glimpse of the result, main result. And sometimes it tells us uh, the future research directions also. So that's what uh, the conclusions are. Now, uh, last few slides. You can learn writing by writing only. So, uh, it is not, at the beginning, I show you a few books, right? Reading is essential. But even if you read 100 books, you won't be able to write unless you start writing. There's a Chinese saying, the thousand mile journey start with first step, right? First step. So similarly, you know, writing can be learned by writing only, not by reading. Yes, reading is essential, but you need to write and improve writing. That's how we write, right? So. I'll ask you one question at the end. What is the difference between a bad writing and a good writing? Think about it. I'll give you a few seconds to think the bad writing and good writing. What is the difference? Get your answer ready. So we say bad writing, we say good writing. So what is the difference between bad writing and good writing? So I'll tell you the good writing. So good writing is actually nothing, basically rewriting, not so good writing. Rewriting the bad writing is a good writing. So good writing means the bad writing that you wrote, you revise it, you rewrite it and you rewrite it and that it becomes a good piece of writing, right? So that's good writing. And Mark Twain said, writing is easy. It's not difficult. All you have to do is cross out the wrong words, right? Cross out the wrong words and revise the bad writing. It's good writing. And thank you. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to, to, to answer uh, your, your questions. I'll stop sharing. So a uh, few comments, you know, I can see uh, Dr. Habil is here. So uh, I sometimes say that writing is like driving, you know, 
So you need guide, a guide to guide you to good writing. And I, I can tell you, Dr. Habil is a very good writer. So you already have a guide. Uh, in front of you, and maybe there are a few others also because uh, Dr. Habil has written quite a few good journal articles. He has the experience, and you know he obviously can guide you how to write top tier journal articles. I think uh, Habil, you got quite a few top tier journal articles. Am I right? Yeah, Professor. Professor, thank you so much uh, for this wonderful presentation. You enlightened us always, and whenever there is a meeting, whenever there is an interaction. Uh, and again, this was the same way, a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, and I'm sorry, uh, I missed the, uh, yes, the first part. Uh, I wasn't able to uh, properly introduce you. And I hope uh, Dr. Temur uh, did properly introduce you. Uh, yes, to the, all the audiences, Professor Niaz is my supervisor, my PhD supervisor, uh, my mentor, uh, my teacher. I have learned a lot from Professor Niaz. Uh, Professor Niaz is, uh, as he already mentioned, he is an associate professor. Uh, at the University of Wollongong. He's an expert in concrete structures. Um, concrete structure, I mean, there is always something new going on at the University of Wollongong labs. And the enthusiasm and the energy you feel there of everyone, the professor and the technical uh, staff, it is always motivates you that you that you want to contribute to things. Um, professor Niaz uh, also remained the head of the School of the Civil and Environmental Engineering. He has contributed to the development of several codes of practices. He has authored more than 215 articles in the highly reputed international journals and conference proceedings. Uh, as a chief investigator, he has won uh, millions of the Australian dollars in research funding. Uh, he's the co-editor of uh, many research articles, associate editor of Australian Journal of Structural Engineering. Um, there are so much to tell about Professor Niaz. Um, what I'm here Thank today you. is uh, because of my supervisor, Professor Niaz, uh, because uh, when I was crafting my first article, I remember that time that it took us two years to uh, draft an article and uh, they were calm and they were composed. They were like uh, uh, always trying to bring me to that point to understand what uh, writing an article really means and what are their different sections. Um, I cannot appreciate that much, Professor Niaz, no those things. But again, he enlightened us today with uh, writing an article with, uh, with, his, uh, with his methodology. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Niaz, again for that thing. Uh, there are a couple of questions, I believe, from the audience. Um, Professor Niaz, with your permission, if we can proceed with sure. the question. Yep. Please. Uh, so, is there any question? Please just raise your hand or uh, you have coordinators in your rooms. Please ask them to assist you in asking questions. Uh, Dr. Temur, can you please unmute them, uh, the the coordinators in the rooms or anyone who raised their hand? Please, Dr. Temur. Um, yes. Uh, by the way, uh, Dr. Habil, it appears you already know the contents of this presentation. As you, with your conclusion, you did put a smiley face on this webinar. So it did work out like that. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one question uh, from me, and then I will be passing the mic onwards. Uh, so, Professor Niaz, uh, uh, also as an editor, uh, are there times when you, uh, like when you receive an article on your desk and you think that it has good content, but it was very confusing? So, it like just because of that, you'd feel like it's you cannot pass this on for a reviewer. Yes, so it, it happens, uh, if I understand your uh, question correctly, uh, it means that the content is there, but it's not uh, well uh, written, then how should we take the decision? Uh, if you look at the rejection rate, desk rejection, that's what we say, is about, uh, if you talk about the top tier ones, the Journal of Structural Engineering, it's more than 80%. Right? And I assist uh, Journal of, uh, Austin Journal of Structural Engineering, is, is a top in Australia, but having said that, it's not internationally top. But even in Australian Journal of Structural Engineering, the test rejection rate is about 75%. So when we get an article, we read the article. And if it is confusing, the structure is not there, the results are not uh, substantiated, the claims are not, uh, you know, based on the findings, then it is going to be rejected. So it won't be published. So, and that happens to 70 to 80% of articles. If you talk about, say, 
talk to Jang. I think Dr. Habil published in, uh, uh, you know, Jang for, uh, yeah, Composite for Constructions. Their rejection rate is 90%. So it's difficult to publish. So I would suggest that there should be original contribution and should be crafted properly, as I discussed in my uh, you know, presentation, the things should be there in order so that we know full story. Is is this the question that you're looking for answer? Is or, or um, yes, yes, exactly. any... yeah. so a rejection uh, is quite you know it is very difficult I should say to get into top tier journal articles when we say Q1 the top Q1 are difficult to get simply think that Journal of Structural Engineering uh, they publish. 12 journals, 12 articles in each issue. They have six issues. So it's about 100 articles every year. So look at how many professors are there in this world. So essentially means that there are lots of professors who couldn't even publish one article there. So we need to write it in a way uh, that attracts or that has some essence, some important issues discussed in that article and packaged it properly. Otherwise, it is hard to get published. Uh, good, good. Thank you. Um, I will, Mr. Shweb Mohammed. Uh, you may ask a question, please. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good morning, Professor. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, informative talk, and we are grateful uh, to you for sparing your precious time. Um, I have this question. I have, I have actually got a couple of questions. Um, first one is uh, being a young researcher, I'm currently pursuing my PhD. Um, I have this, we, we, all, uh, we always uh, uh, come up with this uh, problem regarding the research gap and original contribution. Now, my understanding is that if a certain topic or a, a certain topic has not been addressed or not studied in Pakistan, uh, it has been studied somewhere else, but it has not been studied in Pakistan. Uh, if we take the example of, uh, let's say, materials, I am a student of management, but being a civil engineer, if, if I take uh, an example of materials, uh, for instance, uh, a certain study has not been conducted in Pakistan. And my problem statement or my original contribution is that um, since uh, any research is, uh, we, we uh, this topic of sustainability is very uh, uh, prevalent nowadays and uh, the issue that uh, the context or the local studies are important to understand its effectiveness uh, in a certain country but when we submit that study uh, stating the problem statement or the original contribution being that the study has not been conducted in Pakistan the we we often uh, face rejections. Uh, they say that, uh, okay, the study has not been studied in Pakistan, but what would be the effectiveness of this study globally? Uh, so, Professor, if you may uh, answer this question. Uh, well, uh, this, this is an important question, I should say. Thank you for asking me this. You know, there are two ways to tackle this problem. First of all, you know, before publishing an article, we need to choose the journal, right? So if it is the context of Pakistan solely, obviously, if you write that you, you will use flyers in geopolymer country that we have done 20 years ago, so it is no more new. So you might not be able to publish in, uh, you know, international journals, but you should be able to publish local journals like, uh, you know, uh, engineering. There, there might be engineering institution in Pakistan. So that could be a good fit for local journals. Now, choosing journal articles, that's what I haven't discussed because that's not the uh, our discussion point today is. So choosing the journal, the right journal is also very important. This is the first step after writing the journal article, which journal you will choose. So that's one thing. So you might be able to publish local journal articles, right? Uh, sometime, if you look at the Japan Society of Civil Engineering, so they, they publish good journal, but Japanese context. So so that's one thing but if you want to publish in international journal with the context of pakistan then it is also possible you just need to highlight in a way that would be interesting for international authors why they study in pakistan very different from those study in internationally 
then you can if you if there is any you know important issue that you are doing then that could be a a point for publishing in international journal but if you are talking about only pakistani context and doesn't really compare with international context then no it is not good for an international journal it is good for uh, the local journals right so as i say for top tier journals say q1 journals it's, you know uh, q1 has also many journals but the top few q1 journals then has to have original contribution shouldn't be based on country or shouldn't be based on locality right so if you say that you are using local mud calcinated local mud in concrete it can be published it might be sourced from pakistan but you need to show what is there in that local mud you calcine it what did you get out of it what is the chemical composition what chemical composition really affected then that can be published but if you are talking talking about local cement that you got from pakistan and did some study and if it is the main point no it won't be published it might be good for local journals thank you any other question i think few uh, thank you, Professor. Thank you. Uh, I was actually uh, muted by the host. Uh, there is one uh, final question from my side. Uh, 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 I'm this, these questions may sound very basic to you, uh, no, but uh, uh, okay. So is there any uh, rule of thumb for uh, this average number of tables, figures, and references? I'm asking this question uh, because I recently got a rejection for my paper, and uh, the problem with that paper uh, which the reason uh, which was stated that uh, it actually is very long uh, so uh, when i reduced the content uh, content they stated that uh, i i understood that maybe they had uh, uh, sent that paper to different uh, reviews uh, on the second time so the second time rejection was uh, uh, was uh, came up with the reason that now this content is it does not make any sense so is there any rule of thumb for this average number of tables, figures, and references? Well, I think, you know, if you look at, uh, well, you need to, uh, to answer this question, first of all, you need to look at the journal and see their requirement. That's the first thing. Second thing, an average journal article will have, this is an average journal article, average one, will have 10,000 word equivalent. So which essentially means that 20 page text, right? double spaced 20 page text so shouldn't be more right and at the beginning of my presentation i said uh, the, the two most important thing for a good journal article is clarity and brevity so brevity is important right which means concise so you need to really uh, if you say that in a printed uh, form double spaced with table and figures i wouldn't expect more than 30 pages see as a reviewer if you get an article you need to read so many pages. It's just hard for a reviewer to do that, right? Nowadays, I should say 30 pages, but if you're talking about a specific, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, concrete and materials as a journal, they say that you cannot have more than 10 uh, tables and figures in total. So that's their specific requirement. But it, an LCVR journal, like construction and building materials and others, right, composite structures. So even they do not have limit, but in a printed page, double spaced, double spaced, you can, you should be able to uh, write it within 30 printed pages, 20 text and 10 pages tables and figures. So that's I'm telling, take talking in general, in general, but there are specific requirements for a specific articles. Like if you talk about, um, you know, AC Journal of Structural Engineering, then they say is 8,000 equivalent word. So it is including everything. To give you a guideline, a small figure is 250 word equivalent, a large figure is 500 word equivalent, a small table is 250 word equivalent, a large table is 500 word equivalent. So in total, you can have 8,000 to 10,000 equivalent words. So that's basically the limit. But my suggestion would be look at the journal article, look at their instructions for authors so you get a guideline. You know, 30 printed pages, double space, good enough. You don't need, I mean, you know, if you say 31, 32, maybe 
okay, but not more than that. You know, it is too long, really. Thank, thank you, Professor. Um, okay, there is uh, one question from the, or uh, there's a hand raised in the Civil Computer Lab from Mr. Shakat Abbas. Um, I will be uh, unmute, asking you to unmute. So please uh, uh, bring forward your question. Thank you. Hello, sir. This is Faryat Fatma. And my question is, uh, when the academic communities provide feedback on our writing, how do we incorporate uh, their advice while ensuring our original ideas and uh, stay true to our uh, um, unique voices? Can, can you say your question again, please? Uh, when the academic community provides feedback on our writing, how do we incorporate uh, their advice while ensuring our uh, original idea? Yes. I think it's, 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 you know, every article, I think, thank you for this question. Every article, uh, uh, sh well, will go through, should go through and, uh, you know, uh, some rigorous review process if it is a good journal, right? Not not the cheap journal that you pay and publish. So. So they are blind reviewers. So when you address the review comments, then first thing you need to remember that the reviewer, that review article, they have done it for voluntary. They do not get any money out of it. So they have done it to help the community, the academic community or engineering community, right? So they have done it voluntarily. They spend the time, they read the articles and they made comments. So that's first thing. So why I'm saying it, because even if the reviewer is wrong in your view, you cannot just simply write that, no, you didn't understand what I wrote. You cannot say that one. You need to say that, you need to understand that if the reviewer is wrong, couldn't understand, then you need to remember that reviewer could not understand because I did not write it in a way that reviewer would understand, right? So few important things, do not, refute with reviewer, you explain the thing that reviewer asked to implement. If it is out of context, if the reviewer is wrong, sometimes it can be, right? Then you need to explain the thing that you did, right? Properly, so that reviewer is not. So reviewer is there to improve your article. Reviewer's comment should not, uh, you know, hinder or to, should not devalue your article, should improve the article. Now, if the reviewer didn't understand, sometimes it's easy because you understand, well, you have to explain this because you didn't explain. So you address the review comment. Some are easy to address. Some are difficult to address because uh, maybe you don't know, maybe you do not have knowledge. Maybe it is out of scope of your um, uh, you know, contents, right? So as I say, first principle is reviewer have done it to improve your article. So the reviewer's comment should improve your article. And second important aspect is you have to address all review comments. You cannot just write that, no, you didn't get my point. So I'm not going to address it. No, you cannot write that one. Reviewer is, you need to understand that uh, the reviewer is an expert in that field. So the review comment valid. And if the review is, you think wrong, that essentially means you haven't explained it properly. So you need to explain it. Sometimes, reviewer asked you to do more work. So there is the problem. So if your reviewer asks you that you have presented experimental result, but you didn't uh, you know, present a uh, uh, finite limit result, that essentially means that you need to do more work. So if you do not want to do that one, then because your experiment is already robust, then you can sometime write at a suitable place that numerical investigation is not within the scope of the current article. Right. It is possible to write and editor understands it. Even if your reviewer asks, the editor also looks at at the end of the day, editor's decision is the is the final decision. So editors look at also the review comment and answers, right? So my suggestion would be address all review comments, do not criticize reviewers. And if you do not understand a comment of a reviewer, you can write that sometimes review are written in a way that you didn't understand the comment. So you need to write what you understood by that comment and address the comment accordingly. So if reviewer asks you to do things you couldn't understand, so by the comment, I understood that I have to do these things, I have done this, right? There could be few issues, uh, but main issue is you need to address all review comments. 
and improve the article accordingly. Don't address in a way that the objective of the article is lost. No, reviewer should not dictate in that way. Reviewer should improve review comments or review should improve the article, not really bring down the quality of the article. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. I believe there's one more question uh, from LR7, I think. Um, so I will uh, ask to unmute. This is from the user HP. So, Please uh, unmute. This is LR7. Uh, you may ask your question. Yes. Uh, sir, when the student start the final year project and uh, research, the student uh, write to what? Things that Think. are uh, good words. Student can apply foreign country, but foreign country not uh, considerable the project. I missed a few a uh, few part of it. Can can you say again? Because uh, for internet problem, I didn't understand or didn't hear full question. Can you ask again, please? Um, when the, I, I when the student uh, can use. Uh, sorry, I have uh, muted LR7, but I believe I have the question. Uh, you may raise the hand again if this is not the question being asked. The question is, can you share specific strategies or techniques that successful writers use to craft effective and impactful conclusion that summarizes all points and leaves a lasting impression? So, uh, well, uh, you know, okay, then thank you. I think, you know, uh, in in the conclusion, uh, I, I touched that point, but let's look at you know the conclusion part of it so that you know uh, 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 you know if we look at the conclusion, so uh, a good conclusion should a restatement of the contribution. So what we do, uh, in writing top tier journal articles, the first part, we write what we have actually done. And then we highlight the main results, not all the results, right? The main results, the main contribution. So that's how, how we write. So it depends on the article, it depends on the thing, uh, the item that we presented in the article. And we find out key results and that we restate the key result. And as I said, we start what we have done what we got, and, and then at the end, we write within one or two lines the, the significance of it. But remember that it may look like abstract, but it is not an abstract. So in the conclusion, we highlight most important results that you want the, rev the reader to remember after reading the article, right? Because the reviewer read the articles, the reviewer understand your results, uh, sorry, the readers understand your result, and then the reader will now get the main results, right? So suppose if you are talking about, say, geopolymer concrete, then we say that we developed this geopolymer concrete with 65 megapascal. This geopolymer concrete can be, uh, uh, you know, designed based on this contribution. And then that will uh, really uh, contribute to the sustainable construction practices. So my, obviously the article to article it is different. Uh, I will suggest you to look at a, you know, a few of our articles that we write uh, at, uh, you know, with, I think we look at Dr. Habib's articles also. So we highlighted few important results, right? In the conclusion. So that when I read, finish the article, I need to remember a few results. Those results 
the important result should be in the, in the conclusion. And that's that's a good conclusion. It is difficult to write, no doubt about it, because you need to understand what you want others to remember by reading the article. So that's what it is. And why it is to remember? Because people will read your article, then understand, oh, okay, now I can think of an, another project, right? A good conclusion should start a new project, right? By reading your conclusion, I'll understand that, okay, maybe there is another project that we can develop because this is a good conclusion. So I can actually look at these things more. Okay, so it, it is something that I think I can answer you uh, in this way, but uh, giving you an example then essentially means that please look at some of uh, uh, Dr. Habil's article and you will understand, uh, read one of his articles and see how he wrote introduction, how he wrote conclusion. And then that conclusion, you go back and check what I have said. Conclusion should highlight important results. So that's one sentence I can tell you. The good conclusion will, it will highlight important results. Yes, yeah, Sharon, please. Atemur, can you please unmute uh, Sharon? Uh, Sharum, you are being unmuted. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Niaz. Uh, it yes. was a good value addition to our current practices of writing manuscripts. Uh, I would like uh, to ask simple questions, few simple questions, because most of the questions has been answered. Uh, how can we justify our novelty? in the research article and where it should be. Either it should be in the introduction section or it could be a separate section. And the second question is that uh, writing or keywords, uh, is it has a connection with its the title of the manuscript uh, or just an abstract? Uh, these Thank you, uh, Sharum. Uh, good question. I think the first question you asked, you know, the why should I highlight the contribution, right? The article is about contribution. Right? So the whole article is about the contribution. So I should say uh, the the first, the contribution should be in the title, should be in the abstract, should be in the introduction also, right? And, and obviously at the end, you can highlight the main contribution. So the contribution by reading the title of the article, I should understand your contribution. And the second should be in the abstract. Very precisely, you need to say, because abstract is the one that in one sentence you would write the top most important result. That means the top most important contribution. So first place to highlight contribution is the title. Second place to highlight the contribution is introduction. And the third important place to highlight the contribution is the conclusion. But obviously in the introduction, you will also say your contribution at the end. As I said, the introduction should end with a bang, right? Like like fireworks. So the last sentence of the introduction should be the contribution. So that has to be declared. Now keywords. Well, usually I choose keyword from the title, right? Keywords should be written in a way that if people want to search your article, then they should search with the keyword. When they write keyword, your article should be visible. So the main keywords should be in the title also. Right? You just you know don't write keywords randomly because there is a place to write keywords, right? So no. So few keywords, as I said, the first sentence of the abstract should be should contain about to sixty to seventy percent of the title words. So keywords should be from the title. It's easy to write if you know that the keywords should be. And when we write keyword, we need to remember that these keywords should be written in a way that. If I ask you, how do you search an article? By writing keywords, what kind of keywords you write, right? If the keyword is too long, right? Then, you know, you don't get it because this are word by word. So keywords should be short. One word is better than two words, right? One, because you write word by word. So keywords mm -hmm. is not the content is for others to get your article quickly. The objective is, others to get your article. So complicated keywords actually makes your article less visible. So simple keywords, right? If it is a sheer reinforcement, 
you can write about here only. You don't need to write in Postman, but you can still write here in Postman, right? So you don't need to write reinforced concrete. Concrete alone is fine. Sometimes reinforced concrete is fine. So not three words. Two words may be all right. Three words, yeah, you know, you got you, you lost the plot. <laughs> so it has to be simple and contain the words that people search and get your article. Obviously, those keywords should be in the title. Okay, I would, I would like to continue the first question answer. Uh, uh, yes, uh, the contribution should be there in the specific regions of the article, but I would uh, specifically want to ask about the novelty of the uh, article. For example, if you want to highlight your novel work, where it should be specifically. You know specifically if you want to see, if you want to say that you should have some glimpse in the abstract but is the last paragraph of the introduction that will highlight your original contribution you can say that original contribution if you are thinking that you need to write you can write the last paragraph of the introduction you can really write the original contribution as sometimes we say the main aim of this article is to do this that essentially means mm -hmm. that that's the original contribution it's the last paragraph of the introduction that you can precisely, or even you can write the original contribution of this article is this. Mm -hmm. So this last paragraph of the introduction can be a, a good place to write your original. You, as I said, you can you can even write the original contribution of this article is this, this, this. Possible. Thank you, Professor. No problem. Thank you, Shalom. Uh, thank you, Professor. Okay. We can have one more question because we understand uh, considering the significance of this uh, webinar and the content of this webinar that you may have many questions because there are young researchers who are enthusiasts and wants to improve their writing skills. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are, of course, future researchers. Uh, me and Dr. Tehur, we are here to assist you. And if we are unable to answer any of your questions, then of course we can ask Professor Niaz uh, to assist us in that particular question. Um, we can have one more question. Uh, Professor, there is a question in the chat box. Okay. That is it necessary to cite if you if you want to go through the chat yes. box? Is it necessary yeah. to cite every statement in introduction? Sometimes to ensure clarity and smooth articulation, we may write two or three lines out of which one is actually from a published article, whereas two lines are just there to provide clarity of my understanding. Okay, so to answer your question, it is better not to copy a sentence from another article, right? You read a few articles, you understand the meaning, and you write in your own language, in a story format, right? Sometimes there are few general statements. You don't need to cite general statement. So suppose E equal to MC square, obviously someone uh, discovered it and it is well established, you don't need to write it. So if they say concrete is composed of coarse aggregate, fine aggregate, right, and binder, you do not need to cite those. So general statement, you do not need to cite. A specific statement, yes, you need to cite. And as I said, the good way of writing is that you do not copy even half of the sentence from another article. You read this article and write it in your own language and cite that article. So that's how it is. So your one is that if it is your explanation, no, you don't need to cite it. You do not need to cite. You can just cite the, the main context you cite, but your explanation, you don't need to cite others because this is your work, your explanation. So you do not need to cite. But my suggestion would be not copying any sentence from anyone. You sentence, you copy the idea and cite that, but not sentence by sentence. Okay, you, just, it is not a good practice that you, you copy. So remember that one person wrote a sentence, right? Uh, uh, Dr. Habil can tell you, even one sentence we revise few times. So we spend hours and you cannot just simply copy uh, the thing that I spent hours to write precisely, right? Then it is not a justice. So you read the article, get the concept, write the concept in your own way, own language, own way, and then cite. That's it. Uh, do uh, you want to add something? Uh, uh, Professor Niaz, uh, sorry, but I, um... Uh, like there's a slight change like what the question being asked is like let's say you have a sentence and in the end yes. you write the citation right like uh say numerical yes. so it's like box brackets one so yes. i think the question is just that for every statement in an introduction do we need to cite it at the end of the sentence 
or no. how far can we go for taking one citation? No, you don't need to cite every sentences. The the sentences that you write, you don't need every citations. No, no, not that. Uh, if you look at the introduction, you know, there are a few general statements. As I said, you don't need to cite it. Then when you get a specific information, right? Suppose, you know, that, that cement, uh, say one ton of cement, really releases one ton of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, right? You write it in your own language and then you can cite it because it's a specific figure. But there are explanations that you do not need to cite. So in the introduction, really, you know, not a, all statement would be cited. No, not, not necessary. No. And it's not a good writing then. If you said every statement, every sentence that you have, have one references, then that, that's not a good introduction. Introduction is a story as a guide so that you can guide others to uh, to the article. So as I suggested, you know, summarize the other article, not every sentence will have citation, obviously not. No, then it's not a good piece of writing. Is it the question, uh, you know, am I, did I answer uh, Dr. Toimur? Yeah, yeah, that, that was correct. Thank you, thank you. Well, um, you look at uh, good journal articles. I think, you know, I'll suggest look at Dr. Habil's article one, articles also, uh, and, explaining the things or making the story clear, we need to write the story, right? Uh, and remember that introduction is a story, right? And the story can be written in a different way, in a different way, because in one PhD or one research project, we might write two or three articles, right? At least two articles. If it is two, if there are two articles, then there will be two different introductions. So suppose if I write geopolymer concrete, right? Suppose a geopolymer concrete, one of my research area, I can start with writing the difference between geopolymer concrete and uh, ordinary Portland cement concrete. I can start with writing that uh, ordinary the issues with ordinary Portland cement concrete because it has been used 200 years, and then write about ordinary Portland cement and how good it is that we have been using it for construction of maybe more than 100 years and then highlight the problem of it, then it releases carbon dioxide, and which is not sustainable construction. Then we can write about geopolymer concrete that is sustainable, that releases less energy, right? So that's one way of introduction. Second article, then if I want to write, say same geopolymer concrete, but how should I write? I can write that there are lots of industrial wastes in this world, and they are dumped everywhere. They create environmental problem. There is a way to use that industrial waste into concrete. And geopolymer concrete is a concrete that use industrial waste, releases less carbon, and use, you know, recycle the waste material, right? So in a different way that I tell the story, right? But it has to be in a story format. Uh, uh, the question is, answer the question is, no, you don't need to write. You, don't, you cite the key information, the information that you got it. Like if you talk about a figure, yes. If you get an idea from somewhere, yes. This person did this one, but hasn't considered that one. And then you are considering it. Yes, you have to cite that because you get the idea from others. So if you get an idea and you get a figure right, in a numerical digit, then yes, you cite that article. Idea and figures, yes, you, you do it. General information, no, you don't need to because you are an expert, you can write it. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, the audience. Uh, if there is any other question, we will definitely ask. Uh, we will definitely answer your question. Me and Dr. Temu. If there is any some, if there is something we cannot answer, we will obviously ask Professor Niaz. We can send them uh, Professor Niaz an email. Uh, at the end, Professor Niaz, we really grateful to you. Uh, I mean, obviously, a lot of effort has been put together to uh, make this presentation, and content has been uh, studied for this, uh, particularly for this time for organizing this day, this webinar. Um, I mean, obviously, we weren't able to even host the thing, and you are kind enough to host the event as well. Uh, we are really grateful, Professor Niaz. Again, from all of us, thank you so much. Again, thank you, thank you, and thank you so much, President. No problem. Thank you very much. Thank you for everyone uh, for for listening to this one. And I just last one suggestion I should say uh, because I'm a teacher, so I always uh, feel everyone uh, you know I'm a student too and a teacher too. So if you get one key point from my presentation, I think that's enough for for this, and I'll find it successful. Just one key information, that one piece of information, I think should be sufficient, and that can help our writing a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Habil. Thank you very much for all Thank you so much, Professor Niaz. Thank yeah. you so much, Professor Niaz. Yeah. Thank bye you bye. to everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Bye-bye.